Teddy Trunk, we are live on Sirius XM, The Boneyard. It is an honor to welcome in a man that has long been one of my all-time favorite musicians and songwriters on the planet, the one and only Billy Squire. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you. Long, it's been a long time coming. been too long, as I've been saying to you off the air. Uh, my fan... Fanship, is that a word? It is now. <laughs> it is now. We know what you mean. But the importance of your career on my career, I don't know if you've ever even known this, but it's it means the world to me that you're here and that we finally have this opportunity to talk because actually the album that you're celebrating, the 30th anniversary of Don't Say No, was the first record I ever played on the radio in my life. When I was in high school, good choice. Yeah, and it didn't. It wasn't by design. It just came in the mail. <laughs> Trust me. I wish I could tell you it was some timing great is, design. Timing is everything, right? But I, I, I remember queuing that up, and you were the first artist, technically, that I ever saw play live in my life. And the reason why is my first ever concert was Kiss, December sixteenth, nineteen seventy seven, at Madison Square Garden. And who was opening? For kiss on that evening, you Do, and a band called. We'll take the Piper. third caller. Oh, too late! <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you something. It was something to this day. Clearly, I went as a Kiss mm. fan, like everybody. But you guys coming out, it was the first time I had ever witnessed an a, a rock show at all, let alone in a place like Madison Square Garden. And I remember being moved by the fact that. The biggest thing that struck me as a 15-year-old kid sitting there was, how can they make those guitars sound so loud that even up in the blue heaven of the garden, I could hear them? I had no concept of the, of the amplification Yeah, well, we, also had a, we had a great sound man, too, and, you know, and he, had, he had his mandate to turn it up for me. Uh, I've been told that we were actually louder than Kiss, which is hard for me to imagine, but there have been people <laughs> who said that, you know, that we were, had that much going for us, which... I mean, volume is a real is a, is a big element of rock and roll to me. You know, you want to feel it. The problem is that you don't want to take people's heads off. And depending, you know, obviously on how you EQ your desk and all, you can really hurt people. But if it's loud and you do it right, it's, which is what you know, I like to think we do. Yeah. Then it, it works, and then you know, you take it as far as you can. Well, there is so much to cover and to talk about, and of course, the the thing that fans should know first and foremost before we start at the beginning in, in my discussion here with Billy, is that the album that is your landmark breakthrough album, your second solo album, your fourth album, in my opinion, uh, is Don't Say No. To most people, it was your first album, actually. I think that's true. <laughs> that's going to celebrate its 30th anniversary, technically, next year. April, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. April of 81, mm -hmm. it came out originally. I think 30 sounded better than 29 to the record company, and they did it. And, right. You know, right. I didn't know that they were doing that, and when, when it came out and I saw the sticker, it's like, well, who cares? It, hopefully, it will still be out next year, and it will be the 30th anniversary. Right. You get, well, most bands do it a little after. You've actually jumped the gun, so you have a little lifeline yeah. with this to keep going and talking about it I like to be ahead of the curve and and i say that it's your fourth album because i mentioned piper and i am an uh, enormous fan of those two piper albums still to this day two of my favorite records um and then recently your first solo album tell the tape was reissued in england which i have a copy of that's true too and you're well informed that album is equally phenomenal and i've you know, especially listening to this reissue, I'm so into that record. But to most people, Don't Say No really was the emergence of Billy Squire, wasn't it? It was, that's true. And, and, mm, and did you me. do you feel, looking back on that album, even though to most people it was your debut, and even though uh, it really, I think, is, if you count the Piper albums, which you wrote all those songs as well, mm -hmm. is the fourth album in your recorded history, do you feel the importance for that particular album as other people do? I do in a different way, but I mean, it was absolutely the record that I had wanted or had been spending my whole life trying to make. I mean, it, it was, I remember, it felt like it was really the culmination of everything I had done up to then. And it, and it felt, I, it was the absolute best thing I could do. I remember when I finished Don't Say No, I said to people, if this record is not a hit, I quit. And, and you I, were serious about that? You were well. Who knows if it? I, it right. I, I meant it when I said it, right. and, and I was. It wasn't a, it wasn't a cavalier thing that I set up to say after it was already successful. But I really, I remember feeling that good about it and that positive about it. 
you know, and really, actually, I think there was a, a point in time when that record was done before it came out that it blew me away too, mm-hmm. you know. And so I just felt like if people don't get this, there's nothing I can do. Right. And 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 you know, fortunately, I didn't you know didn't have to right. walk that yeah. road because it worked. But no, I mean in that way. It was incredibly important, and I knew it when I did it. I mean, I knew it from what I felt about it um, as a writer feel- and as a player and the way it sounded, you know, getting Mac in to do it. I mean, I knew from the Queen, the, the records that Mac had done with Queen, which basically was the game and a couple of singles. I could hear the way the Queen sound changed, you know, on the record. Mac and was I, the, pro- the guy who Mac, co-produced Mac, Don't yeah. Say No With You. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mac used to work with Jeff Lynn and did the ELO records and worked with Giorgio Moroder and did a lot of stuff out of Music Land. It's funny you say that because there was a rumor. I was working in a record store when Don't Say No came out, and there was a rumor that Mac, who produced, uh, went on it. He did Emotions, right, mm-hmm. as well? Yeah. That Mac was actually Giorgio Moroder's production name from when he did Rock. <laughs> there was a rumor that they were the same people, at least back when I was a kid, but clearly yeah. that's not the case. No, Giorgio actually, that's a whole other story, but Giorgio doesn't spend a lot of time in the studio from my the experiences I've had with him. He gets people like Mac, you know, and gets and he finds people who he knows can do what he hears and what he wants, and he puts them on the path, and then he goes to lunch. <laughs> he comes back and we do the work. As I've heard Rick Rubin works like that, He's too. He's brilliant. No, Giorgio's brilliant, but I mean, I am digressing a little bit, but when when I did um, the Metropolis soundtrack with him, that's what happened. You know, he he came into Musicland with a little demo. Said, "Want to want to be a part of this?" You know, Freddie's doing it, and everything. I said, I said "Sure, let me hear it." And so I, we took this little demo and made it into a record. And you know, I did put some drums on it and guitar and this and that sort of thing. And Mac and I did it, did our thing. It was, it was while we were doing Emotions, we were finishing it up. So we did it. Okay, Giorgio says, why don't you come to L.A.? I guess I was going to be out, I was bringing the record out to L.A. or something. So he said, well, you know, when you come out, bring the track and we'll mix it. To my studio I said, okay, great. I'm going to work with Giorgio. Cool, it would be interesting. So We should tell my audience real quick before you continue to just jump in who Giorgio Moroder is because this being a hard rock channel, it's not a name that's going to come up a lot, but he is a, a renowned producer of dance records, that's right? That's right, yeah. Uh, Donna yeah. Summer, am I correct? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I can't even go through the whole... But he's, chrono- he's but, known yeah, that's, completely for the dance yeah. disco scene. Yeah. 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 So and it was that, hugely successful. Just so people understand the dynamic of you doing that with him. Yeah. Go ahead. It was hugely successful. And, you know, and a lot of dance records had cool sounds and cool beats and rhythms and right. things like that too so there you know to me it was an, an interesting thing to to say oh you know let's let's see what rubs off from Giorgio you know so i got to go to la and and he says uh i've just opened a restaurant come come and have lunch and we'll go to the studio so okay fine so we go and have lunch nice place in beverly hills and drive up to a studio and he introduces me to his engineer and the track is up and and he says, uh, "I gotta, I gotta go do something. I'll be back in a, you know, in an hour or whatever. Just go ahead and work." So, the engineer and I, I mean, three or four hours, five hours later or whatever, we're still mixing, you know. We and we basically have the track up. It's done, you know. And we're waiting for Giorgio, and he comes in. We play it for him, and he listens and he goes, "Just a little more bass," and he walks out. That was all I got. <laughs> so, what I learned from Giorgio was that he. He li- he liked what Billy Squire did from the record from Don't Say No. Right. He knew Mac very well. He liked what Mac did. He knew so he believed that we would you know he would give us and this Mac song. And Mac was an engineer for him. Or yeah, Mac was an engineer. His engineer. Yeah. So he believed that you know the combination of Mac and Billy was going to give him something good. So he brought us this track and we did it. And then he felt that the engineer who he had in L.A. working for him knew what he wanted and would do it. And so he didn't have to do anything. I mean, he, he, he just made brilliant choices of putting the right people together. And then, he, like I said, he just went off and did whatever he wanted to do. But you're talking about that at the time when you did a song for the soundtrack to Metropolis, which yeah. was years after Don't Say No. How did It was in Emotions. It was, it was at the end of Emotions and Emotions. Okay, so how did you... Because the evolution... Well, let's start at the beginning. For people that don't know, Billy's first band that put out recorded music. You had bands prior to Piper, but mm-hmm. your first band was Piper. A&M Records, 77, 78, 
Can't wait. Were those the two? I think it was 76, 77, actually. Okay. So seventy mid 70s, mid to bump, late yeah. 70s. Piper. Piper was a three guitar band, which I just, No I, keyboards. That no, was my thing. You know, I wanted, uh, I wanted Fleetwood Mac again, you know, with the three guitar onslaught. Oh, uh, <laughs> again, picture me. I mean, here I am. You want to talk about shaping my world. I'm going to see Kiss. I don't know who the opening band is. And I sit down. And this band comes out loud as hell with three guitars, and that was my first ever live rock experience. And it just, <laughs> from that moment, set, and then Kiss Changed comes out life. and blows everything up. And yeah. I walked out of Madison Square Garden <laughs> that night, and it was like, this is the ultimate. This is it. <laughs> and I went and got the Piper records, uh. and to this day, uh, cherish those records. I went so crazy to get them. Now, they have been, I finally got this, which I'm sure you've seen. I have one. Uh, two on one, Piper yeah. and Can't Wait on the same CD. It came out a year or two ago, but for years, these albums not available in America That's on right. CD. Um, I even went and hunted down Japanese imports like 10 years ago because I was so consumed with getting these albums on CD. But, but give everybody, because I want to go chronologically if we can, uh, starting with Piper, the the origins of Piper and and how that kind of because I want I want people to see how that kind of shaped what led up to Don't okay. Say No. Well, Piper really came about uh, through the good graces and vision, I guess, uh, support of Bill Coin, who recently who passed recently away. passed away. Yeah. That, uh, uh, I Bill Bill was was Kiss's manager. For those of you out there who don't know that, and uh, I actually met Bill at the record plant in New York on an Aerosmith date. I've been friends with Aerosmith for a long time. By the way, oh, yeah, Roll Away, Away the, the Stone. Stone was written by Richie Super. Right. Good friend of Steven Tyler's and someone I've known for quite a while. And of course, and you know that the Boneyard, your show, Joe Studio. Is, is, is the name of Joe yeah. Studio. And I'm going to Dallas tomorrow to see Aerosmith. So I don't know. This is a big Aerosmith v moment strange. here. You know, Send and, my best to Joe. He's been here I many will. times. And I've been to the Boneyard, actually. I've been to his place. It's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I met I met Bill at Record Plant, and he Bill had wanted to actually manage a band I had called the Sidewinders in Boston, which was a kind of just under the radar pop band who was kind of a critic's darling, but never really, never really quite got it together. Bill had wanted to manage us and take us to Casablanca, and it didn't quite happen. So I had met him previously. Then I saw him. I was down in New York. I was at the record plant. He came in. I said hi to him, whatever. Um, a day or two later, I was going back to Boston, and I got on an airplane, and who was on the plane? Bill Coin. So we sat, started talking. It's like, you know, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then, um, so, and he said, that, you know, because he had liked me in the other band. And he was interested. What are you doing? So I sent him some demos or something that I'd been doing, songs and stuff like that. And he said, if you want to, if you want to move to New York, you know, we'll we'll get you a band. You, know, you were which, based in which, Boston yeah, at this point. Yeah, I was living in Boston. He said, you right. know, how, how do you feel about putting a band together? Or, or you know, I want to do something with you. And I said, I want to have a band. And he said, I will do it. Right. So, because I still, I wasn't thinking about being a solo artist. I wanted to be in a band. You know, I would, it's the gang you never have when you're a kid. You know, I wanted to belong. <laughs> right, and you had had two bands prior to Piper that never really got off the launching pad. So maybe more than that, <laughs> <laughs> but but two that are documented. Yeah, Magic Terry yep. and and the Sidewinders. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, but you know, I I've been a, a loner my whole life. So for me, I I wanted to be in a band. I, that that was kind of my goal. So that's why we, we made a band called Piper. But I mean, I picked the people for the band. Uh, I wrote all the songs. It was it was a, it was a veiled solo effort, you know. But with you know with very good people around, and it, you know it sounded like a band. It was a band, but it was really my first concentrated effort. And I had I had left the Sidewinders actually to do that. You know, I felt like I I felt that I was good enough to shoulder the responsibility, rather than feel that maybe I I didn't want to be in a band where someone else in the band was compromising my chances of success, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and I just felt, you know, I was, I was really dedicated to what I was doing. It was going to sink or swim on your shoulders, more or less. I just felt, yeah, I, gotta, I, I can't let anybody get in my way about this. I got right. to take on whatever I can to make it as good as it can be. So Piper was the first, you know, real stab at that. And Bill made it happen. You know, Bill supported us, and uh, we got a deal pretty fast, and, you know, made those records and then then I felt 
that it was, I, I sensed that there were factions in the band who wanted to have more input, you know, who wanted to be contributing songs and, you know, making it more... Wanted to be real, a real band, band dynamic. Yeah, and, right. and again, while I could appreciate that, I didn't feel that those factions were up to where I was. You know, and I felt that it would have been a compromise for me to, to do a record and give away three songs to some someone else or, you know, that, at that point in time. Right. Um, so I just stopped it. I said, I, then I felt the, the light kind of went on and I said, got to be a solo artist. How, how was, successful, how success, two albums, as we said, from Piper, the, the, the self-titled album and then the second one was called Can't Wait. Being having been a kid then and, and just seeing the band live and everything, and, and by the time I kind of really got into the, the records, Piper was done already. But how successful was Piper at the period where you guys were active? I know you opened for Kiss and some other bands, but did did you get some where there were some close shots? You didn't really break, but did you get close to breaking? Yeah, but I mean, what is close? You know, you make it or you don't. No, yeah. we, no, we were close. I mean, you know, we got. We got decent radio play. We got a lot of good reviews. We, you know, a lot of coverage. We played, did a couple of tours. We played a lot of good dates. You know, we were good. You know, it just didn't quite happen. How do you feel looking back on those two records now? Do you like them? I really like, actually, I really like Can't Wait. And it's interesting because a lot of people I know like the first one better. But I had, it's very subjective, stuff like this. I, I felt that the first record didn't get made properly. I mean, it, it just, we have to, I felt that there are tr troubles with the produ the production and the sound and things like that, that it didn't, and maybe because it was the first one that it didn't feel quite comfortable, you know, that, 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 that there were good songs, but I, I always felt that it wasn't quite settled in. And when we made Can't Wait, uh, one of the people who was one of Bill's artistic geniuses was a guy named Sean Delaney. Who also came out like George? I don't. It was a, a lot of disco um, and dance kind of vibe. But and we, he was also Sean Delaney was also very instrumental in Kiss. He and was the choreography. He did the choreography. The, he did that. Right. Yeah, he did that. But um, and Sean was a wild, just a wild, wild man. You know, I mean, anything that could put in the system went in there. And, you know, <laughs> quite, quite a crazy guy, but very creative. And and Bill, Bill asked me. He said, "What do you think about?" working with Sean. Sean and I didn't even get along. I mean, we were from other planets, kind of, in a lot of ways. But, you know, I respected Bill. I said, okay, let's try it. It was great. We had a creative partnership that was terrific. And what I'm getting at is when, when, when we made Can't Wait, I listened to Can't Wait. I think the first side of Can't Wait is as good a side as you get. I mean, I think it's right right through. And I, I, I listen to it and I feel like, yeah, man, that's it. That, that's this is this is good stuff. And I remember Little Miss Intent, which is on there. I think it's track four, maybe. You got it, track four. Yeah. When we did that song, that was the first song I ever recorded where I felt I'm I'm where I want to be as a singer now. That 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 when on that you know that was an example I can remember. That I just felt like now this is it. Now I sound like a real singer. And there were moments like that on Can't Wait, where in, in a way that was kind of a milestone record for me although it wasn't you know a huge success but i was a step closer you know i was i was getting the vibe i was figuring out what it was that made made these things work see it's interesting hearing from your perspective the creator and the writer of this stuff because as a fan it's hard for me. It would be impossible for me. I guess, gun to my head, I'd lean slightly towards the first album in terms of which, if I had to pick a favorite, slightly, mm -hmm. slightly. But then again, I mean, I can honestly say to you, uh, the, this disc I'm looking at, again, is the two Piper albums on one disc. There's 18 total songs when you put both records on one disc. And I honestly, there is not one second of one moment of one of these songs that I don't love. Of course, there's one on, there's a cover on here, the last there time, is. the Stones yes, cover. Yeah. But outside of that, of your songs on this thing, I mean, I listen to these records still, like they just came out, and um, the songs, the, the, the dueling guitars, I mean, it's so right up my alley. I love everything about it. And... Uh, 
before we go on, I mean, because probably a lot of people listening don't know Piper. Oh, I'm sure. So I'm sure I would right. love to play as, as before we continue, and then we'll move to where we're going. We All don't right. say no, but I'd love to play something from one of the Piper records for people. Okay. Do you want to play Little Miss Intent since you said that was kind of your defining moment? I, I'm very happy with that song. If it's okay with you, we can play that. Like I said, you can't pick it. There's not a dud on here. I mean, I, I would sit yeah, here and track I, the whole record as far as I'm concerned, but uh, we can't. We but don't then have you'd the time be losing valuable time. Put, 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 sail give, give away, him. Billy. Sail away. 42nd Street. Ugh. It goes on and on. Coming down off your love. Ugh. It's it's endless. You got me. You're getting. You're, right. you're, you're killing me here. This this we got to do this. <laughs> Billy said the, the, since Billy set this one up to some degree, let's do little Miss Intent. This is from the second Piper album, and again we should mention uh, you can get these albums now for the first time ever on CD in America. What was this? Oh eight. This these came out. Two that, on that one. Sounds about right. Yeah. So check. What, what label is it on? I can. American Beat Records. Oh, yeah, Records. American Beat. Yeah, they've been re-releasing re re a bunch of my stuff, actually. Through Universal. So we thank them for that. Yeah, it's through Universal. So let's uh, let's just give you a little peek, if you're not aware of, uh, you know, Billy, yeah. prior to Billy Solo with his band Piper, which, again, as we said, for the most part, different musicians on the record, but Billy wrote all this stuff and was very much the... Uh, the uh, focal point of this band uh, and these records interestingly enough after you broke as a solo artist working in a record store i remember them being reissued on a&m under the piper logo How about that featuring billy squire burned into yeah, the and, what, and what was the front cover of the piper record was switched to the the back cover became the front because right. the back cover was the picture of me right exactly so <laughs> how <just> subtle <laughs> typical record company uh <laughs> you know action there the album suddenly got new life when billy broke <laughs> a couple albums later which we'll talk about after we do this one little miss intent from the second piper album can't wait featuring of course the great billy squire who was live in the studio with me one of many, many, many amazing songs on those two albums from Piper, written by Billy Squire, who is here in the studio with me. And uh, as Billy said earlier, as we start in the beginning of his career, that that's kind of where you really felt like you kind of came into your own as a singer. Is it that really vocally? Is that what it was yeah, really about? There? Well, that that with that song, that was the thing. Yeah, particular. I particularly liked where I was at on that. Right. But and the song and the song writing process for you, I've always. I mean, I've you've always been one of my favorite songwriters across the board, and I've always felt some of your best songs are not weren't necessarily the quote unquote hits. You know, I always felt that people really dug in your catalog and listened to some of the things that weren't didn't get all the airplay. There's some genius lyrics and songs in there as well. Was songwriting something that always came very easy to you? No, not at all. No, um, that was the last. You know, the last. Um, what should I say? obstacle or hurdle or whatever i started out as a guitar player you know um when i was a kid i was at the age where i was you know i was bit by the beatles and the stones when they came out i was you know just getting into teenage years when they came out and so i was very much into that sort of pop rock thing out of england beatles stones the who right you know kinks stuff like that not unusual pretty and, much all the stuff the most yeah. american rock guys were yeah. into. and i was playing so you know i play in a band and i would play all those songs and throw in an animal song and you know the usual stuff and then 66 maybe 66 67 magic terry who i went to high school with who was not magic terry yet but he was one of my chums and he was a poet and he went to england for the summer um and he brought back a record called John Mayall and the Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton. And that's the record that changed my life. Because when I, I put the needle, dropped that on Key to Love, I'd never heard a guitar like this. No one had. I mean, Clapton re just completely redirected the electric guitar, in my opinion, with that, with that record. It was just brilliant. And I was completely hooked. So that was my goal. I want to be a guitar player. Uh, then as it, as it went along, because I've always could sing and I like to sing, you know, so I, I had the ability to sing, but I was well, not focused on that. Going through a few bands, I alluded to, alluded to this before, when, you know, I, I felt that perhaps I could do a better job handling the vocals than <laughs> some of the people, than the you people were in the band, <laughs> right. you know. Um, so th I then... Got out of the Sidewinders, uh, which is about 1974, and started trying to be a singer. 
I mean, actually, you know, like really, like I sitting in my apartment. There was an opera singer who lived across the hall, and I got one lesson. I went to him one day and said, "Tell me something about singing." And he said, "It's all breath control." And he taught me how to breathe. One day, you know, he said, "You got to breathe from the down." And I've got my hands on my hips now. He said, "You got to breathe. Your bass is down here. You breathe from there, and you keep that. And then you want to project the sound so that you don't." should never come from your throat. Picture it come across the room, you know, whatever you can do, but make, you want to take the stress off your vocal cords, support your diaphragm with this, you know, air cushion and project your voice. Okay, I'll do it. So I would go home across the hall and I would hear him because he, every day he'd get up and be going, oh, right. so, I'm, okay, I'll, stuff, so yeah. I'll do that. So I would do this. I would get up and and I would do it to try to start creating a range, you know, trying to expand my range. Because the singers I liked were all guys who were singing all over the place. Paul Rogers, Rod Stewart, McCartney. I mean, these guys could really, you know, could just hit anything they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, oh, i got to get my range together. So I, you know, started doing that. And then, then I would be, the last piece, I would be sit down to tr try to write songs because... What am I going to do if you if you if you play guitar or you play an instrument and you sing? You got to have some music to do. Well, and I've I've always said, Billy, that I and that I feel. And when people ask me all the time about being in bands and you know, I'm not making it and I can't get there and what do I need to do? I feel that there are tons of great guitar players on this planet. There are tons of great singers and all kinds of musicians on this planet. To me, the real deal breaker, the one that really, I think, in a talent area, sets you apart and gives you that edge, and, and, and the talent that really most impresses me is the ability to write songs. And I don't think there are that as many great songwriters as there are great musicians out there. Probably true. And, and th so, so that's what made you, Probably I think, true. the total package and that you started as a guitar player, you, you mastered your, your craft as a singer, but the songwriting thing is really what came last for you, huh? Yeah, and it, it came last and it, it was an ongoing process. Um, I think the hardest part about songwriting, I would say for me, is, is the lyrics. Uh, and I appreciate what you said about my lyrics because they mean a lot to me and I spend a lot of time on them. But... You know that that's it's hard. How do you learn to write lyrics? You know what I mean. Um, it, it's it and and really find your voice and find find a particular way of expressing yourself that somehow sets you apart. And that was something that you know. I mean, I was just picking my way. I was just doing the best I can and listening. You know, listening to people who I thought were great writers. But you know, you can't really copy John Lennon. Right. You know, I mean, you can sort of learn or set you know or sense the the his sensitivity or or, the, or his intensity or how he turned a phrase but you know you can't really it's hard to kind of rip it off <laughs> and, and you change you, know, you got to find your own way to do something that, that where you you know as i said you kind of find your voice and that that took a while you know i don't think that i had found my voice in piper i i was i was getting closer but you know you can hear you know, you can hear the Stones influence and you can hear me even like maybe at some of them I'm singing a little like Mick or, you know, you mentioned uh, Sail Away, you know, and that, you know, that's that's like Layla to me. I mean, not the song Layla, but it is one of the songs, one did, of the, any day from, from you know, it's, I mean, it, it was, it was still. But, but Sail Away has that kind of Layla-esque type of guitar harmony part in it too. Yeah. Well, it was kind of, I'm just saying that it was still it was still at that time, you know, somewhat derivative, right. and I, which I think we do it's until we find our way. You're, you are you are borrowing and imitating well, plus, and putting it, and then you keep trying to somehow, you know, I didn't have a magic formula which I suddenly went, oh, this is how I do it to be Billy Squire. It just came eventually. But it's a point in your life, too, because clearly when we're talking Piper and your earliest records, you're a younger man. You have different goals. You have different dreams. You have different things, people around you, relationships, whatever the case may be. So your point of reference of what you're exposed to as a songwriter and a lyricist would be different as you, I would imagine, you're a songwriter, so you would know, but as you grow and get older and change and are exposed to different things, the, that palette that you're working from kind of evolves to some it, degree. It, yeah, it always does, just like life. Right. I mean, basically, that's what artists do, I think. You know, I think that we're in some way representing or mirroring 
what goes on. I, and I think Lennon said that, so maybe, maybe I'm stealing something from him again. But I think that, you know, we do. We reflect what's going on, for better or for worse. Because we are drawing, generally, our source material is what goes on around us. What was going and, and we'll move from Piper in a second, and we'll get into uh, you, you officially as a solo artist. But before we do that, one last thing on Piper. What was going on in your life at the time of making the Piper records? Because I played Piper one time for a good friend of mine and they were listening to it they were listening to some of the songs and they said this guy must have been in some bad breakups because there's some lyrics on on piper that the piper albums that are like you know yeah at kind of some shots it's, it sounds like some shots at some people like you know a little bit you know no like, it's actually like not, you were jilted a little it's bit. actually not true it's, it's actually i think that that was um working with themes which which are you know fairly traditional themes you know which which you i think you do pick up in the rock and roll genre you know you you know it's so much stuff about falling in love you know, and bad relationships good relationships being right. on the road you know but piper the piper albums aren't like they you know, were they I weren't love self, you love you throwing no, flowers at oh, people no, there was some there was some biting stuff in there i think that that i think that reflects an overall outlook which has kind of been present to a great extent throughout my writing career, which is that I don't write about happy stuff. And I think the reason is because when I'm happy, I'm enjoying my life. When am I sitting around writing about it? You know, I, I don't. Right. So I'm usually writing when it's something that affects me in a deep way, which is not to say that you can't be profoundly happy. But I know most of the stuff I write about is going to be more, you know, on on the dark side, and it's probably one of the reasons why and it's I not love, Black Sabbath, but right, it, but, it's, but you know, exactly. no, but it's contemplative and it's you know it, it's it it's deep in the way that I it, I am usually wrestling with a conflict or a point of confusion or, or that needs resolution and things like that. And, then, and, and it's probably one of the biggest reasons why I love your song so much because when you write like that, there's an emotion in the music all the so your your albums to me contain so much emotion in the lyrics and the delivery and and everything about them and and that's what i've that's another component of what i've loved so much about your career so maybe it is when you go into that subject matter whatever it is that moves you to write it it, it brings it more conviction when you put it down on tape yeah that's it's very real yeah it's very <laughs> real it's very very real but the first the, the first piper record what it was it wasn't really about a bad breakup i can't say that um i had broke i had had relationships and breakups but it, it, it's not I wouldn't want any of those people who were involved me at that time. To think, oh my God, he's writing that about me because that that was not the that was not the. the point. I mean, I'm just thinking of it for people that don't know. I mean, I remember playing this for a friend of mine, the first song, "Out of Control." It's just like, oh yeah, you know, when like, all your oh, worthless venomous. dreams come true, oh, we'll yeah, be yeah, there yeah. to stand by you. It was just, and it's just like you know, it's a great thing to listen to if you do just go through a breakup, <laughs> man, because you crank that with the windows yeah. down and start screaming at someone. Yeah. It's yeah, uh, it does the trick. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. Billy Squire is my guest it's eddie trunk live here on sirius xm billy's uh, 30th anniversary of his breakthrough album which we're going to get to in just a second uh don't say no the 30th anniversary edition is in stores now we'll cover that in one second but there is what i feel a very important bridge from piper to don't say no uh that i want to bring up and that is what was your first solo album which was released in 1980 the tale of the tape which is now uh there's a great label in england run by a friend of mine uh there uh, dante benuto and derek Oliver, both of them, doing tremendous jobs reissuing uh, some albums that have been out of print on CD, and they just did a great version of, a great sounding version of Tell the Tape, so I've been revisiting and falling in love with this record all over again. Um, tell me about moving from Piper to saying, okay, I'm taking it all on my shoulders, this thing's just going to be branded Billy Squire. Okay. New record deal, new yeah. everything. First of all, though, I have to say that the package that they did, the Rock Candy did for that that reissue is spectacular. It is, and it's the the liner notes. Everything, everything is, great. is everything is is really is really great. And John Astley, who I subsequently got to remaster, don't say no, did tail the tape as well. And that's why I, that's why I went to him to do this second one because he did it's really really great job. This is the album for folks listening that preceded Don't Say No, so it didn't it wasn't the breakthrough album, but to me again brilliant songs top to bottom. Y your thoughts about this and where you were at, you know, yeah. striking out on your own. Um 
Well, it was my first real solo record, and um, I don't know what to say. I mean, I like it very much. It, it, I I felt that it was it was absolutely another big step uh, on the road to "Don't Say No." Uh, the songs, for the most part, I think were were evolving. Were we hate to say use the word mature in the rock and roll, but you know, the, the, I was upping my game a bit. I had, uh, I got very good, very good players. It's where I met Bobby Chouinard, who was my drummer, became my drummer for many years. Um, who we all affectionately look at as the poor man's John Bonham, which is meant as an extremely high compliment. Yep, giant kick drum and the yeah, the Mr. Big the Big Feet himself. Yep. Yeah, um, Bobby's on that record. Uh, Good players. Bruce Kulick, who of course later went on to be a member of KISS. Bruce was in it. David Sanchez from from the E Street band played keyboards. Uh it was a I got a good a good bunch of people together. I wrote some good songs. Uh recorded it up at Levon's house in Woodstock with a guy named Eddie Offord, who was an engineer. He did the Yes records and ELP and things like that. Who again is somewhat of an unlikely candidate, but I had him recommended to me through someone who knew what I was doing, and it worked out very well. I uh, you know, learned a lot from Eddie about the studio, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy with that record. Did, it's not Don't Say No, but I'm very happy with it. And did you, it's, it's a good record, and there's some, there's, some really, there's some really cool stuff on it. Did you feel that, that this... Well, this album has something, has a song on it that has since been sampled... A million ways to Sunday, to from death. what I understand. Most sampled song in history. The Big Beat. Yeah, Big Beat. Which is the opening track on the record, and it's been sampled by hip hop artists. Correct. Um, if you haven't done it, <laughs> you, you better do it. Because <laughs> you need this. In, you need to have this in your repertoire. You know. Now Jay Z used it, right? Jay Z did. Yeah, Jay Z and Rick Rick Rubin did Ninety Nine Problems using that. And they did an incredible job with it. It's, now, it's, now, how did it come to be? Because the tale of the tape was not a breakthrough album. It was not an overly successful album. It didn't really have a, a signature hit on it. How did it come to be that what is relatively an obscure record in your catalog, your first solo record, how did it come into awareness that these hip-hop guys discover this song? It's a good question, I, and I don't know... Um, I don't know a lot of these guys. I know I know some of them. Sometimes you know I bump into them. I know them a bit, but I've I've never really gone and asked anybody who was the first guy to do it. You know I know Run DMC found it. I think what happened. I mean, for one thing, these guys who were who were spinning were pick, just picking up records and and you know listening to them and, and how they got someone heard tail of the tape. I don't know how, but once they did. It started getting it was it was a, played a lot I know in the clubs and things like that and it's it's one of those things it became this massive cult you know cult thing and and run before run did walk this way which was you know the the big sort of crossover breakthrough with right. you know, with them and Aerosmith uh, they did a song on the record before that. And again, I don't I may mix this up a little bit. I think it was their first record. I won't be able to correct you because I don't okay. know the hip hop okay, well, world well, at all. They, well, I, and I may mess this up, but I'll be close. They did a song. I think it was called "Here We Go," which was a big record in the black community or the hip hop community. I don't want to, right. you know, speak incorrectly in the days of political. Correctness. Yeah, I know, you, right? But they'll, they'll they know where I'm, where I'm coming from, right? <laughs> they we were all cool. Um, it was it was a very big record then. So I mean, they had used me before they used the Aerosmith song. So there was it was out there. And then subsequently, as it started building, people just kept using it, and they still use it. People, you know, Jay did it, but it's used all the time. It, it and it is. I one day five years or so ago, someone said to me, you know, it's the biggest sample song in history. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he says, because Kurt Loder just said it on MTV. And they, so I must, I mean, they did a research thing and they said, 
This yeah. is this is this is it. They they announced it officially. So now, as the songwriter, do you you have to get paid when they sample it, right? Of course I do. I was going, but but isn't there <laughs> somewhere they can only use certain amount of bars without paying? I had heard, like in other words, you can use up to a certain point without having to pay. Yeah, I think it's changed though. They they've um, it used to be I think with with song melodies it used to be seven notes. I think, uh, but with the beat, I'm not sure. And they're they're actually using. You know, they're using the master because they want the sound. Right. Anyone can play the beat. Right. So you can't get the sound. Right. Right. It's amazing. And the other thing that's significant about the tale of the tape, Billy's first uh, solo album. Well, a couple quick things. Number one, first time uh, you've had a you had an outside writer, to my knowledge, on there where you did a track with a guy who would go on to co-write songs with so many bands, have enormous success with Bon Jovi and Kiss and Aerosmith and Alice Cooper. I'm talking about Desmond Child, who mm -hmm. w this is one of the earliest rock records, I think, that Desmond turned up on. The year prior to this, he co-wrote I Was Made For Loving You with Kiss. Right. But this was, you know, really the, the infancy, I think, of Desmond as a as a rock songwriter. Just before he got slick. <laughs> <laughs> how did, how slick did, and formulaic, he was not at this time. So, no, we had a, we had a, good, we had a good collaboration. Yeah, that's it's a good a, song. That, that song was actually, as I recall, was the You Should Be High Love, was the, the number one requested song on rock radio for two months. Really? Yeah, when it came out. And the, the last... So that was a big indicator to me. That's, that's kind of what propelled me into Don't Say No. That, I mean... I was on the radio, and I was at the top of every request list for a long time. So the stage was set. Yeah, so I mean, I knew something. It, people knew me. Like, right. Put it that way. That this is the first time that, you know, people in that medium, which is what I depended on to get, yeah. you know, to get out, you know, they were, I was on the radar now. So and, they were waiting, let's see what the next record, when, when Don't Say No came out, people were going to listen to it. Yeah. To see what was on there. And of course... You know, it didn't let up from start to finish. So I mean, that we we it was like setting him up. You know, right. I mean, fortunately, it wasn't wasn't anything I planned that way, but it worked out. I think that was kind of the effect. And the last thing on the tail of the tape before we move on, that I always wanted to ask you is, you actually re-recorded one of your old songs with the tail of the tape from the Piper days. Uh, you took a, a second swing at the song "Who's Your Boyfriend" on this record. Tell me about that decision. Now, "Who's Your Boyfriend" was a was one of those bubbling under pop singles a lot got a lot of airplay a lot of people heard it with piper yeah with piper critics liked it a lot it was uh it was kind of in the i would say kind of in the big the big star mold you know big star being also a band like that which critics love and revered by people who discover them but don't sell any records you know where they had no commercial right. success it was, but it was kind of like that and in fact i had met alex back back in those days and Loaned him, loaned him some equipment. His, his big star came to town and had their equipment stolen or something, and somehow got in touch, got in touch with me, and I helped him out. So we had a little history there. But I decided when I was going to be do the solo thing that uh, that maybe that would be a good transitional song because some people might know it, some people in radio and whatever. So that I would try to take it, they might drop the needle on it because they see it and then I would try to do it in a version that was more in line with what I was doing then so that that was my plan mm. well it's 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 a totally different take on the song obviously it's a it's a little shorter a little more direct I think a little edgier yeah, it but, rocks a little more yeah a little bit more but I mean I love both versions uh, it's, it's kind of you know hard to pick um well as I said I was you know I was I was using that that was calculated I was trying to I was trying to use that to to steer people or give people an indication of the direction I was going in you know I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's better than the original it, it's very different from the original the original is, is kind of a more of a pop thing right and then until the tape I'm obviously getting harder I'm trying to go you know I'm trying to put down my rock credibility a bit right know, I'm trying to stamp that out you know and I, when I started as a solo artist I was I was trying to I started consciously trying to frame my work a little more which we can talk about when we get to don't say no because that's i think was the key to don't say no was not being not trying to write everything right you know get what figure out what it is you want to what do you really want to sound like what do you really want to say and then cut out the extra stuff you could have great stuff but it might be outside of the parameters of 
what's going to really hang together. Right. Um, and I was starting to do that on this record. Let's we're going to of course then, you know, now move to the to where it all blew up for Billy in a good way with Don't Say No. But before we do, if, if, I'd like to play something from Tale of the Tape for people because again, I think it's an important record. Record people don't hear a lot and uh I'd like people to hear I think it's important to show where you were on the doorstep of what was about to happen in the next year with this your first solo record. Okay. You, you got a track from here you'd like people to hear? Well, I, there's a bunch of stuff I like on it, but we talked a little bit before about how, you know, sometimes the hits end up obscuring some of the other great tracks. But in this case, since you're, we're talking history, I would say maybe, you know, we should play You Should Be High Love because that's what people heard then. You know, that I mean, High Love was a pivotal song off of that record. So and I think in terms of our, I think in terms of our discussion... We're not here necessarily to hit people to all the stuff they no, don't, no, no, they don't yeah. know. You it, it, this, I think, again, it kind of right. keeps, not, keeps not, things in the parameters of the conversation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we could. I mean, I could dig into so much. We talked a lot about the big beat and that significance, uh, how that is now. But I, I just want to give people a taste of this stuff. Yeah, clearly, we're not gonna, we're not gonna chart tell the tape thirty years after it came yeah. out. Although that would be nice. But if somebody hears this and says, "Hey, that's cool," I didn't know there was a Billy Squire before in the dark or the stroke. This is the stuff that came before it. So don't play it yet because I. Have a little I'm going to do a very very quick thing please do when you listen to the beginning of this song before the band comes in you will hear all the guitars backwards you know where it sounds like the you know what a backward sound it starts and kind of creeps up on you and then rolls over and but we couldn't play the whole thing backwards so what we literally did Eddie and I we I recorded the intro it's it's just me playing guitar we took, the, it was, you know, real tape those days, and we took the tape off the reel, and we cut every chord. So every, whatever it was, foot and a half or two, you know, whatever it was, we cut, and Eddie Swit turned every piece of tape around. Eddie's your producer Eddie on off, this. Eddie offered it, and, right. and spliced them all back together again. So every one of those, this like, is in the first edit, you count the number of chords, and that's how many edits there are before the band comes in. So every time it goes, boom, two, three, four, every one is this process where the record was done, and then we cut the whole right. thing up and turned everything over and put it. And those are fun things that you do in the studio. You know, right. how are we going to do this? He goes, well. I I think if we cut them on, turn them around, it'll work. Okay, let's do it. Right, long, long, long before the days of Pro Tools and just sitting in your computer and doing that's all right. That. No, this is really hands-on stuff. And and you can see the tape on the album cover. I don't know if that's the actual tape, but Billy on the album cover is surrounded <laughs> by open reel tape that, on that's the floor. The story. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's do it. This is from Billy's first solo album, 1980, The Tale of the Tape. You should be high love, co-written by Desmond Child in his infancy as a a rock songwriter as well, uh, and then this. This sets the stage when we come back from the song for uh, the world to discover uh, Billy Squire and everything to go through the roof with an album called Don't Say No, which we'll talk about right after we give you a little taste of the tell of the tape. It's Eddie Trunk Live, Sirius XM, The Boneyard. Billy Squire is here in the studio. Uh, more with him after another brilliant song from his career.